Up next, we have Paul and Guillaume, who are going to present on uh, Wasm engines. Take it away. Let me do this one again. I'm going to do Wasm engines alone. Yeah. OK, hello. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm going to talk about WebAssembly engines uh, for eWasm. Uh, those are they. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the first three uh, or four we have working at, in, some, in some capacity. Uh, it seems that there's a big push to use uh, the Firefox and the Chromium uh, WebAssembly engines. They have, t they have various sort of uh, tiers of, of engines. Uh, they have their baseline engines, which are just single pass, linear pass to, to compile to uh, machine code. Then there are the optimized versions. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I was asked to talk about WebAssembly engines, um, but I just want to talk about what WebAssembly is in general. Uh, so there's a 150 page specification, and uh, it specifies a syntax of the language, so a grammar, so how to construct programs. Uh, and on top of this definition of the syntax, they define a validity, uh, which says uh, you're guaranteed to return or, or pass some arguments, and it, it's guaranteed to do certain things. And then finally, they define execution. Uh, execution is defined as rewrite rules. What is that? Okay, so somewhere in some WebAssembly program we have these two, two opcodes, uh, const zero and call zero. Uh, what does it mean? What does it do? Uh, imagine zero, uh, okay, so first of all, uh, WebAssembly is given to you as a module. It's a WebAssembly module.wasm file. Uh, it's a set of functions. It's a, it's a memory. Uh, it's a ta some abstraction that lets you do function pointers. That's called a table. Uh, some things to initialize these tables and these memories. Uh, things to import and export. And you have this module, which is a set, set of functions. So it maps well to an, an Ethereum account, which is also a uh, uh, account code, which is also a set of functions. Um, and you, can call, you have imports and exports, so different modules can call between each other. But somewhere in, a, in one of the modules, in one of the functions, we see this. What is it? What does it mean? Uh, so uh, const zero, 32-bit uh, const, and call zero. Uh, call zero means call a function, the, the, the function in this module which has index zero. So imagine that's the function that has index zero. That's WebAssembly code. You don't have to know what it means. But it's some chunk of whatever that you can execute uh, when you see this code somewhere else in that module. So this is how a WebAssembly program executes. We see this, these two opcodes, and then we execute these opcodes by rewriting wherever we see this, we replace it with that chunk. So what, what is this chunk? We take everything in this function, loop to get local, we copy it, we paste it here, uh, we use something called the frame. This is just what it says in the spec. I'm just mechanically doing what they, tell, what they say in the spec to do. Uh, it says, it, then we have in these brackets, we say locals, uh, there's a parameter, it takes that constant zero, we copy and paste it here, uh, then we wrap all of this code in something called the block. That's just what it says to do, so that's what I'm doing. I'm just rewriting that, and I'm deleting it, and I'm replacing it with that. Then what happens? Then we, we rewrite the, the thing that says block with this. I just read the specification, I'm just doing what it told me to do. Then what? I rewrite where it says loop, and I punch, and I put in label zero, and then I copy and paste all of this, this text, including the loop part, into here. I wrote it in small text so it could fit. What happens next? This get local. So we're, we're sort of going, going along. We, we saw a block, we saw a loop, then we see a get local app code. What does that mean? What does it do? It says to take that const zero, that's the first local, there could be more, and copy and paste it, it delete where it says get local, and paste into it uh, where it was i32 const zero. Then what? Uh, so we're sort of going along, and then we see th these three app codes. What do we do with these three app codes? It's a rewrite rule again. Uh, we replace these three app codes with the sum, of, the add with the sum of the two, so we replace it with a const one. As you see, it's just rewrite rules. The whole semantics, the whole execution semantics is we're just rewriting chunks, we're copying and pasting text. What's next? Uh, we have a uh, T local, which means we take whatever's above it, put it into the local const, and then we 
also paste it here, and we delete where it says tlocal. I'm just rewriting stuff. I'm not doing anything controversial. It's just what the spec told me to do. Then I'm doing a less than unsigned operation and replacing it with a one because one is, in fact, less than three. So anyway, this just keeps going and going, and finally I get to this. And this is my last slide for the uh, Wasm Engines talk. So what's the point? Why did I just waste your time with this sort of rewrite rule stuff? Um, I went from this somewhere in my code, and I, and I just rewrote it a bunch of times all the way to, down to this. And that's how we executed WebAssembly. Uh, these rewrite rules, uh, so what's the point? Uh, that's how the spec defines it. It's just rewrite rules. Nobody implements their engine like this. Uh, people implement their engines with, with stacks. Uh, there could be one stack, there could be two stacks, there could be three stacks. Uh, when I implemented the engine, I did it with three stacks for, for various reasons. Uh, there's stacks for these function call frames. There's, I have a stack for the function call frames, I have a stack for the labels, and I have a stack for the, for the operands. Other people keep their, frame, their uh, function call frames and their, and their uh, control flow labels in the same stack. There's advantages to doing it my way because uh, if you keep these in the same stack, uh, you have to sort of, every time you re return from a function, you have, you have a linear time if you're nested in a bunch of functions. So that could be a slowdown. The point is, everyone implements their engines however they want to implement it. And uh, people do it differently, but the whole goal is to make web apps. They want to have like, you know, alien fighting games in, in, in their browsers and things like that. And if that crashes, if that fails, who cares? But uh, if everyone's implementing things their own way, uh, uh, then maybe someone's going to have a bug, someone's going to introduce an invariant that they're going to ignore later on, and something's going to go wrong. And if it's a web app, who cares? But if it's a dApp when there's a lot of money on the line, then we might have problems. So I think we have to focus and spend a lot of time making sure we implement it right to audit these engines. Uh, these, you know, we're, we talk about Firefox and Chromium. They want to have some micro-optimizations for their benchmarks that they're interested in. Uh, uh, but but uh, you know, we, we, do we want these micro-optimizations? So I'm just asking questions about, do we trust this stuff? Uh, the spec says to rewrite stuff. No one's rewriting it. Everyone's just doing it their own way. Uh, so what's the right way to do it? I think we have to audit uh, and keep a close eye on everything. So that's the WebAssembly Engines talk. Is that okay? So as Lane, uh, so I'm giving the next talk as well. It's called Turbo Ewasm, uh, increasing transaction throughput. Turbo Ewasm is our code word within our team of uh, increasing transaction throughput. Uh, this is uh, joint work bet between Guillaume and I, and other people on the team, of course, have uh, had good conversations with us. And uh, so the big idea is, uh, what is what are we doing now? Uh, Ethereum execution. Uh, it's serial execution, as you all know. Uh, we're disk I.O. bound, they say, and we have max 20 transactions per second. What does it mean? What does serial execution mean? Uh, we're executing transaction one, then we're executing transaction two, then we're tr executing transaction three, and so on until the last transaction. What does disk I.O. bound mean? This isn't to scale, by the way, but if you took some operating systems course, you, you've seen some image where you're doing some work, and then you're waiting for I.O. And you're waiting, and you're waiting. And if it's disk I.O. bound, the disk, these, these sort of I.O. ranges dominate the work ranges. And so we're waiting, and waiting, and waiting for disk I.O. to come back. And it comes back, and we do work, and we do work, and we do work, and now we're waiting, and waiting again. And so we're doing tra 20 transactions per second, and I don't know, when sort of engineers see this kind of thing, they're bothered. Why can't we? fix, improve this, because this is awkward and we're engineers and we know how to do these kinds of things. So that's, Guillaume and I had some conversations about this. So Ethereum shards, we might have the same thing. Uh, shard one might also be limited to 20 transactions, likewise with shard two, likewise with all of the shards. So uh, some use cases like these plasma on-ramps, off-ramps, uh, state channels, payment channels, whatever, uh, might not be usable if we only have 20 transactions per second. So uh, sharding does scale, help us scale in some sense, but is it meaningful? We still can't use, you know, if a million people want to get out of this payment channel, we, it's still unusable. 
So let's try to talk about increasing throughput on each individual shard and maybe cross shards. So when people say, why can we use sharding, they start talking about independent universes, independent galaxies. Uh, things are independent. What does it mean? What does independence mean? So uh, I guess two trans so we'll define what independence means. Two transactions are independent if they do not touch the same state location. This is an illustration, transaction one and transaction two. Uh, transaction one touches the upper left, the transaction two touches the two bottoms. Uh, and you can consider these transactions independent of each other. Uh, so within, uh, so cr crushed uh, uh, in different shards, uh, we're guaranteed, they say, that a transaction in shard one and a transaction in shard two are independent of each other. So we can, that's the whole idea. They're independent galaxies. We can com execute them currently. But how about uh, transactions within the same shard? So the focus of this talk is within shard transactions and cross shard transactions. A cross shard transaction is a transaction, for example, from shard one to shard two. Okay, so what does someone that wants to scale do? An engineer usually will uh, go to perhaps Wikipedia and look up models of concurrency and they'll read about actors models and process calculus models and maybe we can use these things. And people are using, people are looking at this. I spoke with the actors with capabilities, the gentleman that uh, invented the Primea, which Definity is using, then Agoric is using these ideas, process calculi, our chain rolling, doing great work, fantastic work, and they're talking about paralyzing and increasing transaction throughputs. Um, they're, they're also using this idea of independence. Uh, with Primea, they're called VATs, or with the actors and capabilities in general, they're called VATs. A shard is equivalent to a VAT in some sense, and pr for process calculi, they call it namespaces. So everyone's using independence. So, you know, a good scientist or engineer says, what is this independence thing? Let's define what this means, and let's take it as far as we can take it because, you know, we're engineers, we're working at the margins, let's see, let's see what we can do. Okay, so we're going to define what an uh, independent subset of a block is. Uh, an independent si uh, subset of a block of transactions is such that each transaction is a subset such that each transaction in the subset is independent of all transactions outside of that subset. That's a tough definition, that's the toughest definition of this talk. Um, for example, uh, an independent subset is transactions two and three. Uh, they're independent of uh, all transactions outside of the subset. Transaction two is independent of one. Transaction three is independent of one. So these two are an independent subset. Just to clarify, that's because uh, transaction one uh, can, yeah, do not write to any location that the set of TX2 and TX, uh, transaction, transaction two and transaction three write to. Correct. Yeah. So we have some sort of, maybe you can have a visual proof that uh, you see that uh, transaction one writes to this and it's independent. Uh, based on this, it, the, the definition of independence, which was in a previous slide, which is a relationship between two transactions. And an independence partition of a block is a tr of transactions is such is a, is its partition into independent subsets. Partition, we know disk partitions. Partition of a set is, is, a, is breaking it into subsets such that their union is the whole set and their pairwise intersection is empty. Uh, so the, the independence partition of this sort of block would be one subset is this, just this transaction, a, su a subset with this transaction, and the other subset is these two transactions. And we notice that we might be able to run these concurrently because they're independent of each other, just like shards are independent of each other. Okay, so how do we, how do we uh, build this independence partition? For two or three transactions, we can just look and point and say, look, these are independent, but if we have a whole block of things, it might be difficult, so we have some algorithms to partition the pool. Uh, a transaction pool or tra block of transactions into independent subsets. Uh, what is access list, first of all? Uh, uh, there's EIP 648. There's a push with each transaction. You say, I'm going to touch these state locations and only these st state locations. If I violate this, then, then my transaction is invalid. So there's a push for access lists and shards. Uh, so there's, there's two cases. We, either we can do it with access lists or without access lists. Let's talk first about with access lists. So I'm going to do a visualization, and it, it, is, it might be tough. So we have our block. Uh, we order our transactions from one, just forget about anything below, transaction zero, transaction one, all the way to transaction 60, 63. Uh, we notice that transact, and then we write the same transactions on this column. We notice that transaction zero and transaction zero 
uh, interact with, are, are, not, are dependent on each other, so we put a, a orange square there, and also 63, whatever, this is based on accesses. We take these access lists, we compare, see if they intersect with, the, with uh, you know, transaction 0 and 63. Yes, they do for 0 and 63, so we put a, a orange square there, and we can partition this uh, block of transactions. into independent subsets. So this, subs this, uh, this subset, you know, this chunk of transactions uh, is independent of all other transactions. Why? Because there's no orange, you know, uh, things colored in here. So this is maybe the uh, kitty cat app. This is a, a decentralized exchange. This is some uh, a mixer. This is some ICO. These are one-off transactions. And we can execute each of these sort of chunks independently of, of each other. Because of this independence property, just like shards are independent. Jim? Yeah, I'm just saying, uh, do you want me to, to do that so that you don't have to walk all the time? Uh, I got it. Okay. Likewise, if you have many more transactions, you can break it into independent subsets. Uh, so this is just an idea to parallelize uh, 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 a given block. We're not doing it yet. Um, so that's the big... So you see these independent, there's many, so we can do it, we, we can scale this. Okay, without access lists, it's awkward. We currently don't have access lists in Ethereum, so we might execute a transaction, see if it sort of uh, hinders our concurrency. So if it touches a bunch of these independent subsets, then we won't include it. Of course, there's a DOS attack. Worst case, we'll go to serial execution. Um, but this is one possibility to scale the main chain. And it's all based on independence. The simple idea that, you know, independent universes, galaxies, we're just taking this as far as we possibly can, like we're maybe scientists or engineers. So then each independent subset we execute on its own CPU, perhaps. We've already known this since, since uh, EIP 648. This is nothing new. Um, but this, but this, sort of, this, this looks like the sharding picture, where shard 0, shard 1 to shard n. But each one is sort of not shard. We're sort of dynamically creating shards. And uh, we're solving two important problems. Within a single shard and cross shards, uh, we, we, we can use these ideas. So we, Guillaume and I are sort of uh, trained in computer science, science and we sort of talk about operating systems. And when you take an operating systems course, uh, you learn about uh, threads and preemption. Uh, and we have this disk I.O. bottleneck. Uh, so our, our idea is to use threads. So each thread corresponds with an independent subset. So we start executing thread one, which is independent, you know, the top left corner of independent or whatever, it starts executing, it asks for disk I.O. Uh, there's a scheduler in operating systems, as you know. It'll preempt this thread while it's waiting for I.O. and schedule this thread. So it's doing work. Uh, this, this, this thread starts waiting. This independent subset is waiting for, for I.O. Preempted. This one's doing work. So we're, essentially, we're, we're trying to use 100% CPU. Uh, so we're trying to eliminate this I.O. bottleneck, whether it's disk I.O., whether it's uh, network I.O., whatever it may be. Um, and we, we're just using things from operating systems. We can just use a regular operating system with pthreads or whatever. This stuff is available now. Um, or do it, you know, with many CPUs. So hopefully we can use 100% of hardware. Um, that's the dream of, like, you know, computer scientists. Use 100% of hardware, I think. So. Guillaume, can right. you clean up? Um, so as, uh, yeah, as Quick, uh, maybe a reminder. So the question, thank you, was about uh, bottlenecks. So IO, uh, if, um, Paul has very, very well explained that uh, IO is, uh, is a bottleneck. In Ethereum 1.0, it's uh, disk IO. It's uh, apparently, apparently it's debated whether it's the biggest bottleneck, but it's definitely uh, up there. Uh, in Ethereum 2.0, if you start having stateless clients, if you need to get your state from the network, uh, it's not so much disk I.O. Well, ultimately, it will be disk I.O., but it's not so much disk I.O. as network uh, latency and things like that. But that means that you will spend a lot of time waiting for uh, your, your data to, to arrive or to be written. And as a result, uh, this, is re this really makes sense to try to get the, the computer or the, the, the miner to do something while this is happening. Uh, so what uh, 
we want to do with this with this work, like that was the preliminary research work. What we want to do is to uh, is to increase, uh, sorry, to extend uh, the definition the definition of independent independence between transactions. Do you want, for example, imagine you have uh, like uh, let's say an ICO or a crypto kitty kind of. Uh, Kind of um, profile where a lot of transactions correspond to the to the same um, to the same contract. Uh, can you also uh, generalize the independence to uh, to calls within the same contract? Can you, for example, use something like um, SIMD or you know some MapReduce kind of uh, kind of um, a programming paradigm so that you can make sure that every single thread or every single transaction touches a different area of the state and run them concurrently, knowing that uh, they won't uh, they won't interfere. Uh, so that, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're we're looking into. Uh, we also want to look into other um, other uh, ideas. For example, gas calculation. So. Uh, you heard before uh, about the metering or the Sentinel contract, something that will scan your contract and add calls to, the, to use gas to make sure that the gas get properly uh, accounted for. Uh, what we would like to do maybe is, ex well, we would like to see if we can explore, uh, what well, we'd like to explore possibilities to actually pre-meter the contract, so reduce the need to, to do this, because, uh, well, first you have to scan the, the contract, but then every time you have to make a call, and uh, that's, kind of inefficient. So we want to see if we can just have simple uh, gas rules, see if we can uh, have uh, an upper bound or a formula. We just look at, uh, at your binary and we say, okay, this is roughly what it's gonna cost and charge that. Um, we, one of the interesting things that really, uh, where WASM really brings a benefit, it's the replace contracts, con contracts call with function calls. Um, so right now, when you call a contract, you have to reinstantiate a lot of things. Like you basically, uh, I'm talking about Geth. Huh? Uh, you create uh, a, pretty much a new VM, a lot of uh, data structures. But ultimately, this is uh, what you want to do is uh, is a function call. You're not actually calling a contract on a different computer. You're calling uh, something on the same computer. So why not make it uh, a function call? Uh, so you would have something like uh, import, you know, like uh, in pseudocode or uh, uh, pseudo Python, import that function from a contract address and just uh, get everything loaded. And you can start doing uh, lots of things uh, that uh, get inspired by oper operating systems, like you know, uh, manage modules, like you, like operating systems manage libraries. If you see that a module <coughs> gets loaded very often, you just leave it in memory so that when you load it. Uh, you, it's already there. Um, you can do something, uh, uh, require modules to have the full list of contracts to uh, basically like you had access lists for, for uh, state locations, you could also enforce the same thing for modules. Uh, we also get inspired by tu uh, TurboGeth. Unfortunately, uh, the, the TurboGeth uh, presentation was uh, at, the, at the concurrent time in, uh, in a different room. Uh, but uh, yes, so the, try to replace all the, the state try, or at least try to optimize the way it's stored, the way it's accessed. Maybe that's still a, um, a suggestion from, uh, the name escapes me, I'll lose. Uh, Alexei. Yeah. Alexei, thank you. Smart guy. Uh, yeah, very smart guy. Um, how to maybe have all those contracts, all those states in a um, like linear contiguous space, why not, with uh, protection, of course. Um, yes, and uh, we also want to uh, use some of uh, the features of WASM that are on the roadmap. They are not; they haven't been uh, uh, released yet, or at least not officially agreed on yet. But you have mu uh, mutexes, you have SIMD. So for those who don't know, SIMD is uh, a single instruction multi multiple data. So the processor uh, has one instruction that uh, uh, does the same thing several times. Um, it uses the parallelism that is inside the, the processor. And yeah, that's, that's what we're, we're looking into. Yep. Um, and I think that was it. Oh, doesn't work. Yep, that's the last one. Okay, that's the last one, that's what. Thank All right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillaume and Paul. That was really intense. Uh, big applause again for them. One addition to all of this is uh, we are considering all these different improvements and we're, lucky, we're in a really lucky position that we can consider 
adding these improvements to the eWASM testnet or spinning up a new eWASM testnet and add these improvements to it. Um, but hopefully, if we manage to add any of these, uh, they're going to be a really good uh, test bed to have them fully specified and finally implemented in the mainnet. Um, now, next one on stage is KCD Trio. Casey has been around forever. He's really into research, and he's more into keeping Ethereum alive and into improve Ethereum. And his talk will be about uh, a new idea how you could do scaling on a much bigger scale. Um, and we may also consider having this on, on Iwasm at some point. Um, big applause for Casey. Thank you. Yeah, it's not exactly a new idea. It's just Ethereum 2.0. Uh, Jasper Serenity research, um, which <clears throat> I heard in the news recently that the Ethereum 2.0 research is stabilizing, finally stabilizing, which is good to hear because maybe now we can answer one of the most basic questions, uh, which is how, do, how are we going to deal with a large and growing account state? This is one of the um, main problems in scaling, even if we wanted to scale 1.0, um, we would have to deal with uh, the account state. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and this actually doesn't have uh, really anything to do with eWASM because eWASM is just an execution engine and the execution reads and writes to the state. So if you want to implement an execution engine, then you've got to decide how you're going to handle the state. So, so I guess it kind of falls on us to decide that. Um, so we wanted to say a little bit about it. This talk, it's not going to be uh, highly technical. This is supposed to be an overview um, for, for, you know, of like the developer experience and the user experience and the um, challenges and changes that will have to be made uh, in order to scale Ethereum. So just the goal is having a lot of users, a lot of transactions, and transactions and where the gas price remains cheap. Um, if the gas price is if the gas supply is limited and you have a lot of users, then the gas price goes sky high. Uh, so how do we keep the gas, get gas prices cheap again? Um, well, if you don't want to sacrifice decentralization, you could just run all the validator nodes on, um, well, all transactions on 21 validator nodes on supercomputers. But if you, don't want to trade off decentralization, then ideally you'd be able to run a validator node on you know, any consumer laptop. Um, that way you can just keep adding more laptops and uh, the network can scale. So to solve this dilemma, our hero uh, sharding, Jasper McShardface. Um, what's the plan? Phase one. We collect a lot of data blobs. Uh, we have a pretty comprehensive spec for doing this. Uh, you know, it's um, like eight different teams building it out. It's the beacon chain. Um, they say, you know, some of these prototypes uh, should be functional soonish, uh, and then then there's phase two. Well, phase two, we think we're going to use eWASM, but we still, I mean, we're not really sure how we're going to do phase two. We still have to iron out some details. Oops. Um, but there is good news because uh, phase one is actually the, the hard part. So phase one is the consensus protocol. The consensus protocol um, comes to consensus on the order of the data blobs. Um, coming to the, the, the consensus protocol is actually um, you know, very complicated because the outcome is non-deterministic. Every validator has a different view of the network. You know, data blobs arrive in you know, different orders to different validators. 
we have uh, all kinds of hairy game theory issues with uh, you know malicious actors and network partitions and uh, it's yeah it's it's uh, it's a challenge. Um, phase two, uh, relatively speaking, is much more straightforward. You all you have is uh, it's a deterministic system. The order of the data blobs is already known. You have one block, you process it. You get, you know, if the next block comes, you process it, and so forth. Um, so, with if if phase one is behind us, and you only have to worry about the execution engine in phase two next, then you're actually, you know, uh, not that far from the finish line. But we learned um, <laughs> yesterday that. Shasper is actually kind of lame. Uh, he can be a bit of a buzzkill. My two main complaints about Shasper are that, for one, it won't shard, it won't, it won't scale contracts that exist on the main chain. You know, Shasper is going to be, excuse me, Serenity will be uh, a new, you know, parallel universe of 1,000 empty shards, and users will have to migrate to them, you know, I don't know, redeploy contracts, transfer state somehow. Um, but when it launches, it'll be a ghost town. Get it, Casper, ghost town. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, shards are gonna have, the gas prices will be independent on each different shard. So, you know, in theory, this is not really a problem because if you end up on a really popular shard and the gas price is expensive, then you can just you know move to a cheaper shard where there's not as much activity. Um, I think you know this is I mean yes in theory, it's kind of like telling people you know who live in San Francisco and are complaining that the city is not scaling the supply of housing that well it's no problem you should because you can just move to North Dakota. 1.0 problem, uh, the scaling problem in general, 1.0, 2.0, is that there's uh, too much state. Um, users pay a one-time gas fee, they create an account in the state tree, and that account is there uh, forever, and all the full nodes, all the miners, um, just have to keep all this, these, you know, junk around uh, indefinitely. So what techniques do we have? What approaches do we have to reduce the state? We have two of them. Uh, stateless clients and storage rent. S <clears throat> With stateless clients, there's a single 32-byte storage route. And when you send a transaction to the network, um, so miners, validators, have only the 32-byte uh, storage route. And when you, as a user, send a transaction to the network, you have to supply the Merkle proof of your account. So you can prove that your account has such and such a balance, and you can send Ether. Um, these Merkle proofs have to be up to date. So I am uh, have a, a visualization of that next. But um, in contrast, storage rent validators basically um, Users pay validators to do this job, to keep the account in their state and to keep the Merkle proofs up to date. And when you have uh, storage rent with an, uh, an eviction or a sleep and awake, like a, um, if, if accounts don't pay rent, then they get evicted from the tree. But then there's ways that they can, be re they can revive their account and uh, Come, come back into the tree, then, I mean, basically those techniques are very similar to uh, how stateless clients work. So it's kind of like, with storage rent, there's um, two classes of users. There's like first class people who can afford the rent, who the validators handles all of their Merkle proofs, and the second class, which is all the poor people who have been evicted and will have to supply their Merkle proofs in order to um, reawaken their accounts. Uh, with stateless clients, there's just the one class. It's everybody, you know, in coach, 
um, everybody has to supply their Merkle proofs. Uh, yeah, it's not a new idea either. Um, just, you know, this is from the Ethereum analysis report from Lisa Authority back in 2015, and it was even you know, discussed in Bitcoin before then. Uh, so yeah, the problem with keeping your Merkle proofs up to date is that at the top is the state root, and then, so at the top of the tree, at the bottom are the leaves, these are where the accounts are. So your account is one leaf, and then next, next to you is a, another account, and that's somebody else's account. Uh, but the branch, the, the proof data that you want to supply is this Merkle branch from you know, your leaf account up to the state root. And in that branch are these intermediate tree nodes. Now, <laughs> these intermediate tree nodes uh, change when the guy next to you makes a transaction. So it's not, so if you go offline and then you come back, it doesn't matter that you didn't make any transactions. It matters that, you know, other people are making transactions and now your proof is out of date. So you have to go back in history and kind of reprocess these transactions to get your proofs up to date. Um, yeah, so people really don't like either statelessness or storage rent. The reason they don't like statelessness is because, uh, again, the problem of keeping your Merkle proofs up to date. Also, um, somebody who flirts and smokes weed a lot said this, that uh, when I wake up from cryosleep, I just want my um, brain wallet to work. I don't want to have to, uh, you know, it, it, you imagine if 50 years later um, your proof would have just been changed, like, you know, within the first year after you went to sleep. So if those blocks are still available somewhere, then you're okay. But the question is, you know, what happens if those blocks are no longer available? Then, well, you're screwed. And that's kind of why people also, you know, you could say set up, there could be some service that says, I promise I will store, uh, you know, all the old blocks, even if you come back 50 years. Um, trust me, they'll be here. And people say, well, I don't want to trust these rickety, you know, layer two services. I want, you know, val to have some guarantee that validators will be storing my, um, my account. Obviously, uh, People dislike rent because you get evicted if you don't pay. Also, uh, capacity is limited, so the you know fees can spike high. Um, it breaks user experience that we've you know come to expect that a contract will still be there. Uh, there are workarounds for this, like if um, you know again this sleep and awake, but that's just you know adds uh, it adds complexity, which maybe you can tuck under the hood. From the implementer's point of view, uh, if you're starting from scratch, then in my opinion, stateless is obviously the way to go. It's clean, simple, uh, it's ideal. Val uh, validator only has to store a 32-byte state route. Um, rent is messy and complex. There are lots of parameters. You have to decide, well, you know, I mean, do you set it at 16 gigs or 32 gigs and then you know, how do you do the fee market, so forth. Um, I think s some people even, the stateless is almost too simple, so they just like, you know, engineers who sometimes like complexity, and they just can't resist from adding a <coughs> rent feature onto the stateless. Um, I mean, if you're not starting from scratch, so if you have like uh, Ethereum 1.0 today, then it's probably easier, you, you already have a full, tree that the miner is forced to um, to store, it's probably easier to, you know, add on a rent feature and, you know, start trimming the accounts. Uh, <clears throat> then, you know, swapping out the whole thing and switching to statelessness. So lastly, the point is that change is coming here. Um, 
Currently, miners have this full burden. And while it's, you know, it seems kind of easy because, you know, somebody else is, uh, I don't know if you're using Infura in, in or MetaMask or a light client, uh, it, you know, it's relatively easy to sync. If you're running a full node, it's still difficult to sync. Um, what is going to happen is that uh, it, it's not sustainable for miners to keep storing all the state. So uh, validators are, um, the disk space is going to be minimized. The core of the network, um, you'll be able to sync very quick. So life for a validator will um, become great. Uh, you know, the process of syncing and processing blocks will become very streamlined. But on the other hand, if you are a user or a wallet client, uh, life is going to get uh, somewhat painful. Uh, syncing is going to be harder. Um, scraping, you know, the data to, um, you have to manage your own data, you have to come up with your own proofs, um, unless you, you know, can pay the rent. So, <clears throat> that's it. I mean, uh, yeah, wallet developers, uh, we're kind of a, a tough time ahead of you. That slide, okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Casey. Big applause for Casey again. So thank you all for uh, being here today. Uh, we're going to pull up the, the URLs again. Please join the Gator Room. Uh, try the testnet, the URL for that is ewasm.ethereum.org. Um, all the demo what uh, Jared has shown should be visible there. Um, join Gitter again, get the discussion started. Um, we're going to have this EVM panel now, focused on EVM. Uh, we're probably going to be free after that if you guys have any more questions. Um, that's all the details you need to know. Thank you. <laughs>